Welcome to my lecture online. In this video, we're going to derive Bernoulli's equation. A number of viewers already have been asking, well, where did it come from? How, does, how did Bernoulli come up with this equation? Well, here we intend to show you how he did that. So let's say that we have a pipe that has a larger cross-sectional area here and a smaller cross-sectional area over there. Also notice that the height has changed as well. But we know that the amount of fluid flowing through the pipe has to be consistent all the way through the pipe, which means that if the, the diameter gets smaller, the velocity has to increase in such a way that the amount of volume per unit time that goes through the pipe in one end must be equal to the amount of volume per unit time that comes out the other end. Notice here we have the cross-sectional area at 1. We have the pressure at 1, the height relative to some standard position, h. This is the volume of that particular element of the pipe. Notice the volume will be equal to the cross-sectional area times the distance x1. We know that the fluid will flow through this part of the pipe at velocity v1. On the other hand, we have the height h2. We have volume 2, but volume 1 must equal volume 2. Since it has a smaller cross-sectional area, there will, be, there will be a bigger x2. Velocity 2 there will be larger than velocity 1 and pressure 2 will be over here, pressure 1 on that side. So now, how do we come up with Bernoulli's equation? Well, we need to have three different concepts. The first concept is that the amount of fluid per unit time flowing to the pipe has to be constant. Also, the density of the fluid is, this, is defined as the mass divided by the volume, which means the mass of any given volume of fluid is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume. And finally, we have to come up with the equation of work. Work done is equal to force times distance. So using those three concepts, we should be able to come up with Bernoulli's equation. First of all, we're going to start with this. Notice that volume at 1 will be equal to the cross-sectional area times x. So this can be written that d times a1 x1 with respect to time, so that's the derivative with respect to time of a times x, is equal to the derivative with respect to time of a2x2. Now since a1 and a1 here can be taken out of the derivative and a2 can be taken out of the derivative, we have a1 times dx1 dt is equal to a2 times dx2 dt. And finally, the de definition of dx dt is equal to the velocity. So we can say that a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2. So that gives us a relationship between the velocities at any point in the pipe and the cross-sectional area. Next, what we're going to do is we'll go over here and we're going to use the definition of work done. And we notice that we have work done on here on the left side and work done up here on the top side. So we're going to go work done at point 1 is equal to F1 times D1. The force necessary to push the fluid this way times the distance that we cover. Now the force that we require to push the fluid depends on the pressure at that point. And we know the definition of pressure. Pressure is equal to force divided by area, which means force is pressure times area, meaning the force at point 1 will be the product of pressure times area. So the work done at 1 is equal to the pressure at 1 times the area at 1 and then times the distance at 1, which is x1, the amount of distance that the fluid bus pushed from there to there. Now we have the same thing on the other side. We can say that work 2 is equal to force at 2 times distance at 2. So exactly the same way we can say that work at 2 is equal to the pressure at 2 times the cross-sectional area 2 times x2. So now what we can say is that the work we put in on one side minus the work put in on the other side, the difference in the work. Let's say we put more work in here and less work here to move the fluid from there to there and to move the fluid from there to there. The difference in the work will equal to the change in the potential and the kinetic energy of the fluid. So what we can say here is that W1 minus W2, and again, that's assuming we did more work here and less work there, although we can assume the other thing, and if we did more work here than there, then the change in the energy, potential kinetic energy, will be a negative change. 
But if we for a moment assume that this is bigger than this, that that will then cause a positive change in the potential and or kinetic energy. At least the net change in the energy will be positive if W1 is bigger than W2. If W1 is smaller than W2, then the change in the energy, the total energy, will be a negative quantity. So what we can say here is that the difference in the work done will be equal to the change in the potential energy plus a change in the kinetic energy. And again, depending upon the relative size of these two, this will either be positive or negative. And notice one can be positive, the other one can be negative, one can be greater than the other. Again, we know that this is true, that the change in the work or the difference in the work put into the system and taken out of the system is going to equal to a change in the energy, total energy of the system. Now, how do we express the change in the potential in the kinetic energy? We can do that as follows. We can say that work 1 minus work 2 is equal to the potential energy at the end, that would be mgh2, and we can make that m2, mgh2, minus mgh1. So what I'm saying is that this is the final potential energy, this is the initial potential energy, the difference between the two will be the change in the potential energy. If this is bigger than this, then the change is positive. You, it gained potential energy. If this is smaller than this, then the difference will be negative, and that we, means we lost potential energy. And then here with kinetic energy, we can do the same. This is equal to 1 half mv1 squared minus, oh, let's say here, no, we want that to be 2, the final potential uh, kinetic energy, minus 1 half m1v1 squared, the initial kinetic energy. So the difference in the work put in and taken out is equal to the change in the potential energy plus the change in the kinetic energy. Now the next thing we do is we write what work is equal to. Work is equal to the pressure times the area times the distance covered. So this is equal to P1A1X1 minus P2A2X2 is equal to and here, instead of writing m, we can write what m is equal to, which is the, the density times the volume. So this becomes the density times volume 2, gh2, minus the density times volume 1, gh1, is equal to, oh, not equal to, plus. And here we can do the same thing, because mass can also be expressed as density times volume. So 1 half density volume 2 V2 squared minus 1 half density volume 1 V1 squared. Next what we can do is realize that the volume at each end, volume 1 is simply equal to the cross-sectional area times X1. Here volume 2 is equal to the cross-sectional area times X2. So we, we can replace volume, volume by area times x. And so we do that in each case over here. We have P1 minus density A1 X1 G H1 and here plus one half the density. Again this will be A2 X2 V2 squared minus one half the density and V is again a1 x1 times v1 squared. Now notice we have an equation. Half the terms have a1 x1, the other half of the terms have a2 x2. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate those two. All the ones with a1 x1 on the left side, all the ones with a2 x2 on the right side. So on the left side we have p1 a1 x1 and then grabbing this over to the left, that becomes plus the density times A1 X1 G H1 plus, when we bring this across, we have one half density A1 X1 V1 squared equals, and move everything else to the right, so this goes to the right, becomes positive, P2 A2 X2, that's this term going to the right, then we have this one right here, plus density times a2 x2 g h2 plus, and this term on the right, one half density times a2 x2 v2 squared. 
It's beginning to look like Bernoulli's equation, but now we have to make one other, one other determination here, realizing that A1X1 is the volume over here, V1, and A2X2 is the volume V2, and we already knew that the amount of volume going through the pipe has to be constant anywhere along the pipe, which means that V1 equals V2, or A1X1 must equal A2X2. That was the premise of this. And so if that's true, then we can say that since A1X1 is equal to A2X2, we can divide both sides by A times X. It doesn't matter if it's A1X1 or A2X2, they're the same, so that can all be eliminated. So that means we have P1 plus rho GH1 plus one half rho V1 squared must therefore be equal to P2 plus rho G H2 plus one half rho V2 squared. And here you go, that is indeed Bernoulli's equation. And of course, realizing that each term or each side always must be constant. So in essence, this is always going to be equal to a constant. In other words, we can say that P plus rho G H plus one half rho V squared is always going to be equal to a constant, which is the outfall of Bernoulli's equation. Now, again, what we said here, that this predicated that this must be true, and if this is true, which it is, then we have a nice equation for Bernoulli's equation. That's how it was derived.